All right, so let's get going. So good morning, everyone. My name is Trevor Probert. I'm alongside Lori Caldwell, also known as Compost Gal. She's a master composter. She's a gardening expert. Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So we are supported today by Jean Nader and Jeannie Pham and Ben Dugan. We all work for Stop Waste. Stop Waste is a public agency in Alameda County. We support residents, businesses, schools, and the cities in the county around waste reduction and sustainability. And then our team, the community outreach team, we have the pleasure of providing public education and resources around building healthy soil with compost. So today, this is our first fall webinar as part of our healthy soil series. Today's workshop is called Gardening from the Ground Up. And you know, if you can walk away with one thing today, uh, just as we, I hope that you can understand as a gardener, we're not just growing plants, but we are also growing soil. And if you have healthy soil, healthy plants will follow. So everything that Lori and I were gonna be presenting today is focused on soil health. And that includes useful practices like using compost. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that we're very much used to doing these workshops in person. This is our first <laughs> time doing a webinar. So I just appreciate everyone's <laughs> understanding that we're kind of figuring out how to do this as we go. Um, a couple logistics before we begin. Um, so only panelists are able to share their videos. Attendees, you are here and you're automatically muted. Um, and we depend on everyone to participate by asking questions using the, uh, the Q&A button that's at the bottom. When you ask a question, it won't be visible to others right away. But Jean Nader, who's um, on our team, she will be doing her best to answer uh, type out answers to each question or as many as she can get to. When she types an answer, they will become visible to everyone else. Um, but we've also built in a bunch of time today to answer as many questions as we can out loud. Um, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted online afterwards. And um, this webinar is also happening in partnership with Fremont Leaf, which is an amazing urban farm partner, a gardening resource down in Fremont. Um, Stop Waste partners with Fremont Leaf because they are a model of soil building practices and we get to work with them on our carbon farming project, which we'll share a bit about today. Um, so Elaine, the farm manager at Fremont Leaf, uh, both Stone Garden and the Bee Sanctuary, um, I believe she's with us this morning. So Elaine, would you like the chance to talk to folks about Fremont Leaf and share any announcements? <clears throat> I wonder if I can help you. Let me see if I can help. Oh, it doesn't look like Elaine's with us. She was, she jumped in a second ago, but I don't see her right now. Well, if she can join us, I'm sure she'll have an announcement. I do wanna let folks know that um, Fremont Leaf, they are, uh, their leaf winter seedling sale is gonna be open to the general public Thursday, October 1st. They have like a no contact online sales system with curbside pickup at Fremont Leaf and Stone Garden. They're um, selling winter veggies, including brassicas, root and leafy veggies. Um, and for the first time, it looks like they're offering uh, curry leaf trees and Narcissus paper white bulbs. So if you want to uh, ask Elaine questions about, the, about either the seedling sale or anything else, you can contact her at plants fremontleaf at gmail.com and I'm going to I'll include that email in my follow-up to everyone so don't feel like you have to write that down um so let's see the agenda for our morning um or this is the agenda for our morning in between each segment we will try to squeeze in Q&A with questions that people asked us during registration we will be um, doing a quick assessment, figuring out you know, who's with us this morning. Uh, we'll, have, we'll get to know your soil. We'll talk about why it's important to focus on organic matter. We'll go um, into depth about practices that you can use at home to build healthy soil. We'll talk a little bit about carbon farming, which it's exciting in the registration. A lot of folks mentioned that they had never had heard of carbon farming before. So this is a great opportunity for us to introduce that concept to you. We'll talk about all the free resources that Stop Waste has been developing over the last few years that we want everyone to use and share and um, everything's available digitally online. We'll talk about how you can help us with an evaluation and then enter our raffle. And then whatever time we have left at the end, we'll continue doing question and answer. So 
for the folks that are attending with us today, we asked in registration um, a little bit to, we asked folks to share a bit about their gardening experience. So I just wanna share, you know, most of the people joining us today are beginner gardeners, which is great. Um, we've definitely noticed that during shelter in place, there have been a lot of um, new gardeners and, you know, uh, I just think it's important. Everyone starts off as a beginner and, you know, you're definitely gonna, Definitely plan on making mistakes, but that's how folks learn. And hopefully what we can share with you today are gonna to help you um, experience success. During the registration, we looked at all the questions that people asked. And so we tried to um, categorize the questions as much as we can. So you can take a look here at the list and see what pe other people are interested in learning about. Most of the questions revolved around how to prepare, amend or improve your soil, which is perfect because that's the focus of today. Um, I do want to address a lot of folks ask questions about composting. Um, our, next, our next webinar in the series is on backyard composting on, sec on Saturday, October 17th. So we will be saving the deep dive into home composting practices for that webinar, but we will still talk about using compost a ton today. And then, um, yeah, we will we'll try to answer all, as many of these questions as we can throughout the day. So I'm gonna hand it off to Lori to get us started about talking about soil. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, like Trevor said, I'm Lori. I'm one of the educators here at Stop Waste. And um, uh, thank you for bringing us into your house uh, this Saturday morning. So let's get to know your soil. Uh, know your soil is very important. Knowing what you're kind of working with soil-wise makes gardening so much easier to do. I can attest to that. Um, there's about three different soil types that we'd like to talk about. Um, and I'm sure if you were already a gardener, you already kind of really know um, the trials and tribulations or whatever soil that you have. So we are talking about things like clay soil, uh, sandy soil, that's the kind of soil I have, and there's silty soil, but you can usually only find that kind of near waterways. Um, but some people do actually have silty soil. So soil in itself, and if you look at our little pie chart here, is comprised of mostly, mostly broken down particles of rock that bring us the, the sandy or the clay um, soil particles. Uh, it has a lot of air and it has a lot of water in it as well. And then that small little section there to the right, um, living organisms and then dying and decaying matter. Uh, those are really the key um, everything else is fine, but without that section, which only ends up being about 5% or so, um, it makes a huge difference to, to make sure that you can have healthy soil. Uh, if you look to our example on the right, you're looking at a perfect example of healthy soil. And as we get on, you'll be able to um, see some um, unhealthy soil, I guess, or soil that doesn't have as much organic matter in it. So you'll be able to distinctly tell the difference between the two of them. The one here on the right though is beautiful. It is dark in color. It looks moist. It, and there's a lot of things inside that we can't even see. There's a lot of bacteria and fungus that runs through it. Um, it's held together just on its own, just kind of freestanding. So it's really important to kind of know what you're dealing with. Uh, it really does make gardening uh, that much easier. So I talked briefly about the soil types before, and as you can see the particle size clay, you can barely see that little tiny dot at all, but actually you can only really see it under a microscope. So it has a tendency to kind of really bind itself together um, and hold onto water uh, really a lot longer and doesn't really do really well with drainage issues. Um, if you look on the other end of that, you're looking at the sandy particles, they're very, very large. So with that, they make it possible unfortunately, to drain a lot of water and to drain a lot of nutrients uh, a lot faster than, than I, would personally, I would personally like. But by using compost in your soil, uh, you're able to use it in clay soil. And you can see the example on the right. Um, if you use it in clay soil, um, it opens it up and it makes it possible to increase the drainage and allow things like roots to penetrate through it, which sometimes is the problem. Um, it also allows, um, it gives space to of the uh, invertebrates that live in the soil makes it, makes it easier for them to travel 
to the soil as well. And now on the flip side, with sandy soil, that compost is gonna hold the particulates together a lot longer. And so it's gonna hold on to water a lot longer, which is one of the great things about compost. And it is going to hold on to that nutrition a lot longer as well. All right, so one of our favorite tests as educators is um, the nitty gritty test. I, like I said, this is one of these great little tools to kind of find out what you're really working with as far as the, uh, your soil type. And uh, you might actually be a little bit surprised. Uh, a lot of people think that their soil type is one way and it actually ends up being um, something completely different. So we have a video to show you. So um, whenever you're ready, Trevor. Thanks. I hope, I hope this is the first time we've uh, done videos on webinars, so I hope it works out for folks. The plants in your garden depend on healthy soil. How well do you know your soil? No two soils are exactly alike, which makes your soil unique. Gardeners should get to know the texture, color, and smell of their soil. It's also important to know your soil type. There are clay, silty, and sandy soil types. A mixture of these is called a loamy soil. Each soil type behaves differently from the others, and all plants prefer certain soil types. As a gardener, you cannot change your soil type. But that does not mean you cannot improve your soil. You should always consider organic matter alongside your soil type. Soil type refers to the mineral particles in your soil. While organic matter gives soil its dark color and rich earthy smell. Clay soils are dense and feel smooth and sticky. They drain slowly, are more difficult to work, yet are packed with nutrients. Organic matter helps open up clay soils, providing space for air, water, and nutrients to flow and access plant roots. Sandy soils are lightweight and feel loose and gritty. They drain and dry quickly, leach out nutrients, yet are easy to work. Organic matter helps unite sand particles into a spongy texture, providing greater nutrient and water holding capacity. No matter your soil type, organic matter improves your soil. The nitty gritty is a tool that helps gardeners see their soil type. Use the nitty gritty to see how much clay, silt, and sand make up your soil. To make a nitty gritty, you'll need a trowel, a clear jar with a lid, and some water. Choose a central spot in your garden. Scoot aside mulch to reveal your soil, and use a trowel to dig at least six inches deep and place that soil into the jar. Fill your jar slightly past half full. Fill the rest of your jar with water and cap it tightly. Give the jar a good shake, making sure all of the soil mixes with the water. Lightly swirl the jar to help the soil settle evenly at the bottom and place the jar on a flat surface. Sand, silt, and clay particles will settle at the bottom at different rates. This will help create separate layers that you can observe to identify your soil type. A layer of sand will settle immediately followed by a layer of silt, finishing with a layer of clay. It will take up to a week for your nitty gritty to completely settle, like the example on the right. While it's hard to tell in this video, the three layers will look very distinct. The layer of sand looks rough, while the layer of clay looks smooth. Organic matter floats to the top and gives the water a peaty brown color. What layer is the tallest in your nitty gritty? Clay, silt, or sand? This is your soil type. Remember that you cannot change your soil type, but you can change how much organic matter is in your soil. Apply compost and mulch to add organic matter and build healthy soil in your garden. <laughs> so it's mentioned in the video that it was hard to tell the different layers. When you do the nitty gritty at home, it will look something like this where you will see very distinct layers. So in the example on the right here, there's um, a distinct layer of sand, it looks gritty, um, and then a distinct layer of clay, which is darker and smoother in color. And so like Lori said, you'll, you might be surprised to find out what type of soil you actually have. A lot of people definitely default to thinking that they have clay when they might actually have a sandy clay loam. Um, and those two different soil types, you know, they behave very differently. 
So Lori, um, some of the questions that folks asked in the registration, one question was, what kind of soils should folks choose for their garden? Okay, well, I am going to answer that question with a question. Uh, what type of gardening are they going to be doing? If they are going to be doing something like container gardening, I would recommend just straight potting soil for certain. Um, potting soil has good drainage elements, which is really good for container gardening. Um, are you doing uh, raised beds? Then you're going to need to import some soil in from um, another source. Uh, usually those type of soils or they try to uh, mimic a sandy loam situation um, and add a lot of organic material to it. But if you're just looking to garden and you don't have any major concerns with your soil, you should just amend with compost, of course, and uh, go ahead and just garden in your own soil. And then what about for folks that have heavy clay soil? Do you have any tips for gardening in heavy clay? Certainly, and we'll definitely touch on this uh, a little bit later in the, um, in the presentation, but with heavy clay soils, you have a problem, sometimes there's a problem with uh, overwatering them and they have a tendency to get very waterlogged. Um, you also have to be concerned uh, because uh, clay soils, I mean, they range throughout the whole entire profile, but it may be slightly friable on the bottom, um, excuse me, at the top, able for roots to penetrate, but at some point it may come to a point where it's going to hit the this hard pan clay and the roots instead of going continually to go vertical are gonna go horizontal. And so that may affect the way your plant kind of orients itself in the ground, uh, which could also make it fall. So sometimes that's a problem as well. Uh, with sandy soils, uh, of course, I'm, I'm gonna recommend um, using uh, compost, but you're definitely going to want to make sure that you're going to have to amend a lot more often in sandy soils than you definitely would in, um, in any other situation just for the fact that until you can kind of reach a good medium, um, it's going to be a lot of um, a, a lot of catch up when it comes to um, doing, but it is definitely possible. I have done it. Um, like I said, you just have to keep adding adding compost as part of it. Uh, you may notice with sandy soil too, uh, you may notice that maybe your plants are a little bit kind of spindly or a little bit leggy kind of looking. They're not as bushy as they may be. Uh, and that's also an indicator of sandy soils as well. So getting to know your soil type, you know, we mentioned it's important to understand how your soil behaves. You know, and as also, as it said in the video, a gardener really can't do much to change their soil type nor should you try to change your soil type. So your primary job as a gardener, if you wanna build healthy soil, no matter what your soil type is, is managing the organic matter in your soil. So if we wanna use this drawing, this is called Serengeti in the soil. Um, let's use it to help picture the cycling of organic matter in your soil. So organic matter is everything that is or once was alive, um, mostly decomposed plants, animals, insects, uh, especially, you know, things like microbes. Um, so fallen leaves, dead plants and roots, you know, and especially compost and mulch, they feed organic matter to the fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates in your soil. And 99% of these fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates, they are working in support of your plants. They are breaking down organic matter into simpler forms, and that includes, um, uh, that includes plant nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and these microbes have a symbiotic relationship with your plant roots. Um, in your plant root zone, uh, and I really encourage folks to check out our, um, our third webinar, the Symphony of the Soil film screening. They have some really great like microscopic footage of this. In your plant root zone, microbes, especially fungi, they nestle up so close to your plant roots where they almost become the same organism and plant roots are leaking out things like carbohydrates and sugars to specifically feed those microbes because in exchange, those microbes convert those sugars into plant nutrients. So compare this healthy soil ecosystem with a, a garden or a farm that is focused on, you know, trying to kill organisms and with pesticides and herbicides. And then once there's no living microbes in the soil, then the gardeners become dependent on manually delivering nutrients to plants using fertilizers. That's this, the whole conventional method 
you know, it's of using toxics and synthetics. It's done a really good job of destroying soils around the planet. So I, you know, if you walk away with anything, just you, you don't want anything to do with that. Um, and this drawing, it does not over illustrate just how much life takes place under your feet in a healthy garden. Um, so if you want, if we can simplify building healthy soil to one question, the question is, are you feeding the microbes in your soil enough? Because if you are, they will definitely take care of your plants. So um, my recommendation is work with the biology of your soil, not against it. Um, and remember, no matter how much work you're doing in your garden, it's always going to be the fungi, bacteria, and vertebrates that are doing the heavy lifting. So it's just your job to make sure that they can do their job and you do that by feeding them. So we put a ton of focus on making and using compost because compost is matured organic matter. Whether you make it yourself or you're buying it from a compost producer, compost helps jumpstart the biology in your soil. Um, and then plants also have to be a huge part of your strategy. As I had mentioned earlier, plant roots are exchanging sugars for plant roots with soil microbes. And some plants like the fava beans in the center picture, they have a special relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. Um, and then in the right picture, perennials have a really deep and bulky root system compared to annuals. You can see the difference in the picture. Um, the deeper that your plant roots go, the more active that your soil e ecosystem becomes. So you can also consider it this way. If you let your soil go bare with you know, maybe no mulch, maybe no living plants, that's, like, that's kind of the same as allowing your soil microbes to experience a famine. So the great thing about adding compost to a garden with plants in it is it totally kicks in this positive feedback loop where the compost is feeding the microbes, the, the microbes are feeding your plants, and then your plants are feeding the microbes. And it, helps kickstart that um, process into place. So we showed this picture earlier, you know, a teaspoon of healthy soil can have over a billion organisms in it. So don't think of your soil as dirt. Dirt makes me think of something that's, you know, dusty and dead. <coughs> healthy soil truly is a living thing, so you should feed it. And as, as gardeners, you become more experienced with soil building, you know, you'll start to notice healthy soils versus unhealthy soils. Healthy soils with lots of organic matter, they look like a chocolate piece of chocolate cake. It's firm, it holds its form. Uh, it will happily crumble if you apply pressure to it though. Uh, it's full of plant roots, it stays moist for a really long time after being watered. It's dark in color and it smells earthy. You know, I take my dog on a walk every day and you know, I definitely, as I'm walking around, I notice, you know, soils that just are dying for some organic matter to be added to them. You, you'll start to notice it as you, as you go around. I, uh, you might be thinking about your own garden at home and wondering how much organic matter that your soil has. And you can figure this out with your own, making your own observations. And so just like the nitty gritty is a tool to help you see your soil type, there's another tool called the worm count uh, that you can use to measure organic matter in your soil. And this is an actual field test done by farmers. It's recommended by the National Resource Conservation Service. So home gardeners should make use of it as well. It's called the worm count. And I'm gonna share the video right now. Healthy plants in your garden depend on healthy soil. Healthy soil depends on organic matter. Compost and mulch, as well as fallen leaves, spent flowers, and plant roots, feed your soil organic matter. Worms thrive in soils with lots of organic matter. Worms are efficient decomposers of plant and root litters, and also feed on beneficial bacteria and fungi in your soil. The presence of worms can tell you a lot about your garden. The worm count is a tool to check if your soil has enough organic matter. The more worms you can find in your soil, the more organic matter that feeds your soil and plants. To do the worm count, all you will need is a shovel, tarp, ruler, and a small container. Choose a day when the soil is moist, such as in the spring or fall. If you do this activity in the summer, deeply water the night before. Overly dry soil will cause worms to quickly migrate away and will not give you an accurate count. Choose a central space in the garden near your plants. 
Use a ruler to measure a 12 inch by 12 inch square on the soil surface using your finger to mark the area. Scoot aside any mulch to reveal the soil surface. This will help prevent mulch from mixing into your soil. Using a shovel, dig out soil within the 12 by 12 inch square, placing the soil onto the tarp. Dig down to a depth of 12 inches to give yourself a cubic foot of soil. Sift through your soil and search for worms. You might come across red wigglers, night crawlers, and larger earthworms. When you find a worm, place it in your container. If you come across a dirt clod, give it a close look. Worms love to burrow within dirt clods because of their stability. You may be surprised by the amount of evidence of worms that you find, such as worm tracks and burrows to worm cocoons. Worm cocoons are the size of a grain and range in color from yellow to clear red. Empty your container of worms onto a tarp and begin counting. Include any worm cocoons that you could find in your count. A worm cocoon means that your worms were happy enough to reproduce in your soil. The most fertile garden soils may find 30 or more worms, while closer to 15 worms may be the average for most soils. Five or less worms may indicate that your soil needs more organic matter. Thankfully, adding organic matter to your soil is easy. Compost is full of organic matter and feeds the beneficial organisms in your soil. Scoot aside mulch and spread one to two inches of compost on top of your soil. Spreading mulch will help keep your soil moist. Moist soil encourages worms to help you build healthy soil. <laughs> These videos have been fun projects to do while sheltering in place. So, um, you know, I used to be an elementary school garden teacher and, you know, I would do the worm count with my students. It's, if you have a family and young kids, it is a pretty fun activity to do with your family. All right, Trevor. So we've got some questions. Um, can I use the same soil for next season's crops? Yes, yes. Um, I definitely could understand, you know, beginner gardeners might, you know, might think, you know, your plants, as you're growing plants, they are removing nutrients from the soil for each growing season. Um, but rather than replacing the soil to return the nutrients, your focus should just be on routinely amending the <laughs> soils, um, feeding the soil with compost or using other soil building practices to help microbes recycle the nutrients back into the soil for the next growing season rather than replacing the soil altogether. Um, and that, that inc that's included with um, container gardens. Uh, I know with container gardens, you definitely want to repot plants as the plants are growing, but there's no need to necessarily change out the soil as long as you're continuing to amend the soil with compost. How can I control pests in the garden? So we included this question uh, after talking about organic matter because it is so con it's so connected to healthy soil. So having healthy soil helps you deal with pests, especially without using pesticides. Um, healthy plants, they're more resilient to pest attacks. Soils that have a lot of fungal mycorrhizae, which those are the rooting systems of fungi. You know, fungi build up around the root zone and they act like a castle wall protecting your plant roots. Um, for above ground pests, you know, you definitely need to attract natural predators to your pests. So, you know, above ground, that might mean planting plants that are attracting ladybugs or lacewings to prey on aphids. At ground level, um, using compost, it helps attract things like beneficial protozoans that prey on disease-causing bacteria or attracting beneficial nematodes that prey on the nematodes that feed on plant roots, especially things like your stone crop or your, uh, your stone fruits. Um, healthy soil is a, think of it as like a preventative measure. And then plant diversity attracts uh, insects across all levels of the food chain including your top predators like ladybugs and parasitic worms that help keep pests in check. And just always know that your goal is to never eliminate all of the pests because if there's, if there's no aphids in your garden, then ladybugs are gonna migrate out. So 99% of the time you, you look at a bug, it's most likely beneficial. Uh, and if a pest, I'm sorry, a pest only becomes a pest when it's causing real damage to your garden, like when it's swarming or when it's clearly taking over. 
So Lori's going to, um, I, I spoke at length about organic matter's role in healthy <laughs> soil and Lori's gonna share with us a bunch of specific practices that help do that. So we're just gonna get into it. So this is the, what we call the speed dating round. So I'm just gonna give you some uh, quick tips and some um, quick uh, um, things about uh, soil building techniques. So making and using compost. Uh, there's two different types of compost. There's the compost that you make. That's our favorite kind. Uh, mostly out of things like food, uh, food scraps and yard waste if you have it. Uh, and then there's, of course, uh, compost that you can purchase. And we understand that if you're looking to do large projects or you have a lot of beds that you want to amend or maybe you're doing some sheet mulching, um, that maybe you don't make enough compost at home in order to do those projects. So we always recommend that you go out and look, uh, at, look at it in bulk it whenever possible and get something like a recycled content compost. Um, but if you do want to make compost, again, you can make it, uh, make it at, at your house. Uh, of course, we're going to be uh, uh, having a class on October the 17th. It's the second in our series. Um, Jeannie and I are going to be teaching that. It's just going to be all about compost and how to make it and how to use it. So we'll really go into, uh, into depth with that. So compost itself, when you use it, of course, it's going to feed that Serengeti of the soil that Trevor definitely talked about. Um, it's going to, I talked about it, aerating the clay soils and then opening up um, and then clumping together the sandy soils. Um, to make them easier to definitely to work with. Um, it holds onto water a lot longer and it's great for prepping new beds or reestablishing beds. Uh, one to two inches on the top, we call that top dressing. And then if you can use it during the growing period around already existing plants, uh, we call that side dressing, just applying it uh, towards the base of the plant and then watering it in. Making and using worm castings. Uh, worm castings is a wonderful, wonderful fertilizer. It's very high in nutrition, um, very high in nitrogen. So I like to use it in my plants that um, either I'll have mostly leaves or when I'm using it, not when the plant is flowering. It's, it helps with the leaves and stems and the kind of overall skeleton of the plant. Uh, but because it is very high in nutrition, you have to be kind of uh, wary about how much of you use of it. I like to dilute it and make it into a, um, a dilution about the color of wheat tea. And I use that to side dress uh, all my plants, uh, house plants, uh, as well as all my edibles and things like fruit trees, perennials as well. Um, like I said, it's more of a fertilizer. So you're definitely going to want to treat it that way. But unlike a kind of petrochemical fertilizer, uh, worm castings are going to be released slowly slowly into the soil and be taken up slowly by the plant um, in order to really counteract the, the idea of the petrochemical fertilizers, which force a lot of quick, lush growth. And then sometimes that can definitely stress out your plant. Imagine going from the age you are, from the age of two to the age you are right now in two weeks time. So that's kind of what petrochemical fertilizers are. Worm castings are more like just regular food and regular life. You know, um, all right. Um, and then yeah. I, I wanted, oh, sorry, I wanted to add, you know, for backyard composting, sometimes space can be a requirement. So I'm, I live in an apartment. I don't have space in my garden outside a container garden to have a compost bin, a, a basic compost bin. So if you are, you know, if you live in a small space or you live in an apartment, worm composting is super easy. It is super easy way to make your own you know, organic fertilizer for your plants. It's, you know, the, on the image on the right, it's a small size bin. And then, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that you can obtain red wigglers, the type of worms that's used in worm composting. Also too, you may be also be in a situation where you may be okay with just food scraps and you don't have a lot of access to yard waste. So in that instance, I'm gonna recommend worm casting, uh, worm uh, composting as well. And they, they, once you have a bin, they're kind of kind of become like another household pet, right? Absolutely. Applying mulch as a soil cover. So mulch is amazing. Um, we have a great example of mulch on the far left. It's a uh, got it for a sheet mulch project that I did. It's redwood mulch. 
I kind of call that the Cadillac of mulches. It's beautiful. It lasts a long time. But some of the great benefits to it, of course, is it's going to um, retain water for a lot longer. It has a really great way of definitely doing that. And it's going to help when it's on the soil or if it's part of a sheet mulch project, it's gonna help kind of regulate fluctuating temperatures and moisture levels in the soil. And when we talk about plant health, that's especially important. If you have a plant that's just out there around, around bare soil, it's very, it can be subject to periods of hot and cold, hot and cold in the soil or wet and dry, wet and dry. And then those types of things um, can, um, make it possible for it to be preyed upon by a pest or a disease for sure. Uh, also does help suppress weeds. We love doing that, of course. And um, I've had some good success, success with things that are kind of uh, pernicious weeds as well, for sure. Uh, but it is organic in nature and eventually it will break down. It will help feed the uh, Serengeti of the soil, um, but you'll, you'll definitely do need to reapply it um, as often as necessary, for sure. Sheet mulching, just talked about that briefly in the last slide, but our basic sheet mulch recipe is uh, you're going to use about uh, cardboard as the weed blocker, uh, overlapping cardboard. You can either buy it by the roll or you can salvage it from recycled um, sources, you know, Amazon Prime boxes, bike boxes, refrigerator boxes, that type of stuff. Um, you're gonna overlap that on, on your area. And if you have a lawn, I'm here to tell you that you don't have to pull it up. You're just gonna go ahead and cover that and then that lawn is gonna die and that's gonna feed the food soil web underneath. So under on top of the um, cardboard layer, we're gonna add about an inch and a half of compost. And then on top of that, about three inches of mulch, except for if you're trying to get rid of something kind of pernicious, I'd go a little bit thicker on the cardboard and I go definitely a little bit thicker on the mulch. You really want it to last a lot longer and kind of choke that out for sure. Um, it's great for establishing some new gardens. As you can see, we have some great examples um, of a former lawn now turned into a drought tolerant garden, uh, complete with drip irrigation, which we liked. Um, so if you're thinking of doing maybe like a native or drought tolerant or even like a perennial food garden, um, sheet, this process sheet mulching with the coarse mulch would be a great option for that. Um, it's also great for covering bare soil or weedy patches. So if there's just an area that you're not really sure what to do with, go ahead and sheet mulch over it and allow the allow that soil to be rebuilt. And then you can come back later and you can plant or do whatever you would like to do with it. Um, it's great for also for existing landscapes. So if you already have a landscape that you already like, you can sheet mulch around it for certain. And um, I would definitely recommend that. And you know, for folks that have never sheet mulched before or even have never heard of it, you know, those layers, the cardboard, compost, and mulch, over time, it all breaks down and incorporates into the soil. So that cardboard will, you know, if you dig your, your hand into your soil after sheet mulching, wait a year, you will be, it'll be hard to find any cardboard. It will have been decomposed by fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates and adding a ton of organic matter to your soil. Absolutely. Um, it also helps minimize erosion too for keeping it in place. And um, as part of our, our references at the end, uh, we're gonna send you to our lawn to garden.org website. It's all about sheet mulching. Anything you could actually um, need for sheet mulching, uh, you'll be able to find there, including rebates through your local water agency. All right, plant deep rooted perennials. Perennials are the kind of plants that you put in the ground uh, one year and they last anywhere from five to 20 years, really depending on the type of um, perennial that it is. But they are plant, their roots do go deep and there are a lot of benefits to that. It helps to kind of uh, improve the soil, stru uh, the structure of the soil. Uh, and because they're there and they're just hanging out, they leave the soil undisturbed for years and years and years at a time. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of slides about uh, disturbing your soil. Um, they're great because they're able to, their roots go down very, very deep and they're able to pull up water from deep into the soil. And they're also able to pull up um, elements like uh, magnesium and iron, which only really exist really deep in the soil profile. So if you're planting annuals next to perennials, like we have our example on the left, 
then the annuals that are growing next to them, they get to take advantage of the extra water as well as the extra nutrients that get pulled up from, uh, from the soil by them. Cover crops. Uh, now is the time of year, we're approaching that time of year where you can put in some of your uh, fall uh, cover crops. Uh, the example I'm showing you here right now is going to be fava beans. And if you're looking to um, use fava as a cover crop, and like Trevor said earlier, uh, there's, they, there's bacteria that's on the, the roots. You can see that on the right, those little nodules. That's where the nitrogen is and any kind of legume um, is gonna pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and store it in these lovely little nodules uh, for long-term storage. And as the root starts to decompose, so do the nodules releasing the nitrogen in the soil. So uh, uh, any kind of legume, but mostly the cover crops we're talking about are alfalfa, uh, vetch, and clover. Um, they all kind of pull nitrogen from the soil. But when it comes to fava, you have to take into consideration that if you wanna do it for a cover crop, you have to treat it differently than you would if you're just growing fava for seed saving or for eating, of course. So for uh, using as a cover crop, you're going to plant it by seed and you're gonna allow it to grow and then it's gonna mostly flower. And then at that point, you're gonna to wanna to cut it off right at the soil level and leave those roots in the soil for them to decompose. You can just go ahead and plant around them um, for the next season. Uh, the nice thing about it is you can eat the flowers um, they're very tasty, so you really don't have to totally waste it. And then, of course, if you're planting for fava beans and for seeds, you're just going to allow it to grow and, and set seed and make yourself a fava bean. Uh, another kind of really ones that, excuse me, <clears throat> that don't bring nitrogen but are still beneficial are the grasses, things like rye and oats. Um, their roots pen uh, penetrate deep into the soil and help with the soil structure as well. But the nice thing about it, especially if you're planting it in fall, is it helps um, out compete potential weeds. And if you are already a gardener, you'll know that somewhere between December and April, um, we get our winter weeds that we really do have to tackle. So it's a great way to do that as well. <clears throat> Planting diversity of species. Now diversity is good in all types of things, um, but if you're doing it in plants, um, that's more, that's important of course as well. Uh, by planting a diversity, um, if a pest or a disease were to happen to come to your garden and you all have the, the one type of species, that pest can take down the whole, um, the whole inventory of plants. But by planting plants of different species, planting a mix of perennials and annuals, um, you're able to help fight off any potential disease. Or if something should happen, then maybe only a couple plants kind of get taken out, of course. Um, each plant itself comes with its own defense system um, right underneath the soil. It's there's things like fungus or bacteria, um, which increases the diversity not only uh, at the soil level as well. And then the root systems of different diversity plants are important too. You have the fibrous root systems um, that kind of branch out and help with soil improvement. And then you have the deep rooted tap root systems that go deep into the soil and are able to pull up water. So by planting those uh, in conjunction with each other, that's also another great benefit. No synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and herbicides. Um, Alma in the picture, she's actually applying uh, compost tea uh, in this picture. So, uh, which is another really great beneficial and another, another way to process worm castings that's a much longer process than um, a regular dilution. And I would definitely recommend it. It's kind of a fun process. Uh, pesticides are gonna kill the good bugs as well as the bad bugs. So you definitely wanna try to avoid that for certain. Um, all of these things are gonna be responsible for kind of destroying all of our beautiful uh, food soil web friends or you know, our fungus or bacteria, stuff like that. And then when that soil becomes weak, it becomes difficult for that soil to try to process certain things, things like toxins or, and it doesn't become the filter of the soil, it would. And so if, it, if toxins are able to pass through the soil uh, unheated, um, they have a chance to get to a waterway and, and be very harmful in that instance. All right, no tilling. 
Uh, one of our favorite examples is our friend Diane on the left. Uh, she is doing a no-till method uh, by using a broad fork. Uh, broad fork is, it's fun. It's very good exercise, I would think. Uh, <laughs> but the thing about the broad fork is, it is more of a downward motion as opposed to a tiller, which is gonna wanna mix kind of things in the soil. I always liken it to a, um, uh, you can make mashed potatoes a couple of different ways. Uh, making mashed potatoes with a hand mixer is like your traditional tilling. So you're gonna mix everything together. And then what happens is it kind of flattens those potatoes out. You want your soil chunky. And if I can make potatoes my favorite way, which I'm gonna use a hand masher. And when I mash it with a masher, I'm gonna get those clumps, I'm gonna get those chunks, uh, which is really important. We talked about that earlier, about having those great aggregates in the soil, um, those clots. And so things can pass around it, um, our invertebrates and things, of course, like water and nutrition as well. Also by using the broad fork, there is a whole, I like to call it the internet of fungus underneath us and the roots, their hyphae, um, expand out in this kind of network. They're connecting annuals to annuals, to perennials to perennials, annuals to perennials, and they share resources um, and they also share water with each other. But by tilling it, you're basically cutting, basically cutting off everyone's internet. So I know nobody wants their internet cut off. So, um, so that's just a really great way to be able to do it. Uh, as well as with the broad fork, she's kind of creating holes in there she's gonna go ahead and top dress with compost. And so now she's kind of giving her soil, at least a few inches of soil, kind of a little bit of a leg up as that compost is gonna be able to work its way down through those holes and get deeper and deeper into the soil. And it's in no-tilling, you know, it goes in contrast to what I think is like a really common, <clears throat> you know, a, piece, a really common piece of advice that, you know, a lot of online websites give gardeners is to break up your dirt clods especially when you're planting like a veggie garden in a raised bed, you know, sift your hand through your soil, break up the dirt clods, get the soil nice and loose. I, I mean, maybe people recommend that to help with drainage and things, but what we're trying to say is that that is not helpful. You want, like Lori said, you want your soil to be chunky. Those dirt clods are super important because it's not just, you know, it helps uh, roots get access to water, but it's also habitat for things like worms. Worms need soil to be stable in order for them to do their job. And um, there's a, you also might be too, wondering, sorry. oh, sorry, go I'm on. Sorry. No, yeah, my last one is when you till the soil, you are exposing any dormant weed seeds underneath your soil. And, um, and then that just becomes a whole other problem. So if for not any other reason other than that, <laughs> I would definitely say no till. <laughs> So, you know, we've been talking a lot about these practices that help build healthy soil by focusing on organic matter. And you might be wondering, you know, how does your soil actually change when you apply these practices? And, you know, aside from the ecological benefits of, you know, feeding fungi, bacteria, and vertebrates, it really does change the physical structure and stability of your soil. Um, this, on this picture here, this is called the slight test. The slight test is a really cool observational tool that you can use to see the physical stability of your soil. The picture on the right shows two different soil samples and they each came from the same place, Eden Garden in Livermore. The soil, it's a clay, heavy clay soil type, same location, same soil type. The only difference between the two samples is the soil on the right has received compost and mulch. It's been growing veggies year round, um, been growing cover crops and it's a little darker in color uh, which means that it has more organic matter. The soil on the left, uh, it's outside the garden, so it hasn't been receiving organic matter, and it just has some annual weeds growing in it. And so in the slake test, what you do is you take a dirt clod or a soil aggregate, and you submerge it in water. And, you know, in this, in this example, this, these jars have a little basket uh, made of hardware cloth to help suspend the aggregate in water. Um, I have a video, a short one, shorter than the other ones to help kind of see what happens. So, you know, I just put these soil aggregates into, uh, submerged them in water and notice the difference. The soil on the right had higher organic matter. The soil on the left had lower organic matter. And if you focus on the left, as the, the poor soil is absorbing water, 
it's falling apart. The, the pressure of absorbing water is causing, replay one more time, is causing the soil particles to break off the aggregate. And on the right-hand side, the opposite is true. The organic matter is helping the soil hold its form, which means that it's remaining, uh, the soil is remaining stable as it's absorbing water. Um, this picture right here, that's after an hour. So you can see that, you know, the water is cloudy with all this, all these soil particles that broke off the soil. This is, this, that's called slaking. That is happening in your soil. It's not just happening when it's suspended in water like this. You know, in, if in unhealthy soil after a heavy rain, soil is breaking apart and all these little soil particles are sinking deeper and deeper into the soil, causing uh, zones of compaction in the lower parts of the soil. So, um, you know, just that you can do this slate test at home. We have a, for all these three activities, we have um, some guides to help you do them at home. Um, and it's just a, it's just a way for you to see the stability and, um, uh, yeah, the structure of your soil. So Lori, there are a bunch more questions that these all came from registration. And right. um, let's see, it's 9.55. I think we, we're, we have plenty of time. So the first one is, what are some alternatives to fertilizers and pesticides? Well, of course, I'm going to say composts, of course. So um, definitely a great alternative to fertilizers. If you want to go fertilizer to fertilizer, of course, I'm going to say uh, worm castings. And pesticides, it really comes down to um, keeping your soil healthy, um, as well as planting plants that are going to attract beneficial insects that are going to prey upon those pests for certain. Um, what are some tips for gardening in small spaces and container gardening? Um, making sure that you, you're going to have to amend um, a lot uh, more often in a container garden than you would in an in-ground garden just for the fact that the nutrition in the container is just what's in that container at the time of planting. So I find I'm a container gardener myself. I do, uh, my whole backyard is just containers. And I find that I do have to feed him a little bit more often, um, especially things like perennials and containers for certain. I have some several fruit trees and, and they do take a lot of extra nutrition, um, sometimes every about three to four weeks. And I'll I like to mix it up too. You know, I use compost for certain things, worm castings, um, fish emulsion, all different types of stuff. And that in itself is a good diversity as well. Um, does rototilling destroy soil structure? Absolutely. Or it can, definitely. Yes. So, and plus it's a little bit, it's much work. If you could do low till, you know, something maybe with a broad fork or even no till, um, and just apply compost on the top of it. You really don't have to mess with it at all. And then you can get to the fun stuff like planting. Yeah, and, ro and rototilling, you know, it, it, it's kind of deceptive because when it, when it breaks up the soil, you know, if you run your fingers through the loose, loose soil, you know, to us, it feels great. But for plants and for organisms, it is not, does not feel great. And when you use a rototiller, you know, the till zone where the blades are able to reach Yes, that soil gets uh, loosened up, but the blades are actually causing further compaction beneath the till zone. And it can actually create a hard pan where all this loose soil is now, um, as it's getting watered, soil particles are sinking deeper. And then they're beginning to rest in that zone just below where you tilled. And then it creates this hard pan. So Lori was mentioning earlier, you know, soils with hard pans, plant roots will stop being able to grow deep and they'll start growing horizontally or laterally and it totally changes the health of the plant. So we definitely do not recommend rototilling ever. Um, how often should people uh, be applying compost? Well, at least once a season or at least, one, at least once growing season, you can top dress to kind of start new beds or you know a re-amend um, beds that you used last year. Um, but I'm also going to be utilizing compost uh, as a side dressing throughout the growing season, especially in my container garden. So I'm just going to apply either a uh, basic compost around it. And then maybe a little bit later, I may come in with some worm casting, depending on where the plant is at the time. I mean, is a flowering, is a fruiting, that type of thing. 
and then we had a we had a few people ask if they could get compost and mulch delivered especially that absolutely. might be useful nowadays with shelter in place and people you know gardening from home absolutely absolutely if you do go to our lawn to garden uh, org website there's a marketplace and uh, you can uh, enter in your zip code and you can find the closest place that's going to um, get, deliver either recycled content compost or we, and or recycled content mulch. And it's great, they, it's the, usually the cost of it, but they're gonna charge a delivery fee. But if you're doing big projects like sheet mulching or kind of redoing your garden, um, it's gonna be your best option. And then you keep your, it keeps your car clean. And we'll, <laughs> we will share all of our resources that includes the Lawn to Garden website. Um, at the end, so don't feel like folks have to, you know, frantically write that down. We'll we'll remind you. And then, um, how can folks keep uh, people who are dealing with weeds? How can they keep them down or suppress them? Uh, sheet mulch. I mean, that's one of the one of the many benefits of of sheet mulching. Aside from building healthy soil and holding onto water a lot longer, it's going to help suppress those weeds. And especially, you know, and then they all die, and then their nitrogen. Um, ends up filtering back into the soil, which is feeding the food soil web. So I'm definitely gonna say sheet mulching. What about things like uh, like the plastic landscape or the fabric cloth? Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan at all for a variety of different reasons. First of all, it's plastic. Uh, secondly, it doesn't allow any, it, it's not permeable. So it doesn't allow things to, um, to go through it, water or nutrition. I've seen plenty of gardens that have that landscape fabric on it and they've utilized some of the tips that we've seen here <clears throat> and the soil on top of the weed fabric is excellent but then you pull it back and the soil underneath is completely denuded it's all gray it doesn't look like it has any organic material at all so definitely so yeah I'm not a fan okay so um we have uh, a bit a final bit of content for everyone. And, um, you know, I'm gonna begin introducing the, the idea of carbon farming to folks. And the message I hope people can walk away with is that when you're, you're working your garden, it's directly connected to climate change. Um, and so if you're at all concerned about climate change, you know, I immediately think about um, the increasingly intense fire season, then know that healthy soil can actually be a real solution to the climate crisis. And so we've been talking a ton about building healthy soil. And so hopefully I can share a bit about how healthy soil is a solution towards climate change. Um, so the relationship between gardening and climate change, it's, it's fixed around carbon. And you know, carbon definitely gets a bad rap because when I hear the word carbon, I immediately think of carbon dioxide, which is the major greenhouse gas um, that causes climate change. You know, the picture here, uh, these are the cars driving on the 580 freeway towards Oakland. They are releasing carbon dioxide as they burn carbon rich fossil fuels. But, um, you know, climate change is more of an issue of where carbon is on the planet. And so when there's too much carbon in the atmosphere, it is a problem for climate change. But carbon exists in many other forms. And most importantly, carbon exists in soil. And so Carbon, you can think of it as the backbone of life uh, because of plants and photosynthesis, plants are absorbing carbon dioxide from the air and then they turn it into sugars and carbohydrates that help build the plant up. Uh, and then, like I said before, plant roots are also releasing some of this carbon in the form of sugars and carbohydrates to feed the soil microbes. So in a healthy soil, plants are depositing carbon taking carbon from the atmosphere and then depositing that carbon from their roots into the soil, into the microbes. And when those microbes die, some of that carbon stays in the soil for a really long time, um, thousands of years sometimes. So um, that means that that carbon is no longer in the atmosphere causing climate change. Uh, another way to think about it is organic matter, it's about 50% carbon. So soils that have really low organic matter. When you're walking around on, on your dog walk or whatever and you notice unhealthy soils, soils with low organic matter are not holding a lot of carbon. Whereas soils with really high organic matter, they are holding a lot of carbon. So, you know, if we can think about if home gardeners, parks, cities, farmers, ranchers, if everyone was just helping take care of their soil, we could actually pull all this carbon from the atmosphere, stick it in our soils, 
and help reverse climate change. So um, in the registration, we asked folks if they were familiar with carbon farming and a lot of folks said that they weren't. Carbon farming is a set of practices that help you store or sequester carbon in your soil. And as it happens, a ton of these carbon farming practices, uh, they totally overlap with the practices that build healthy soil that um, Lori just talked to us about. So applying compost is the big carbon farming practice that people are talking about. Most of the research has been focused on compost. Um, the idea is that it kickstarts the biology in your plants and in your soil to help pull carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in soils. I really encourage folks to look up um, the Marin Carbon Project. It's a really fascinating story about how a rancher and researchers from UC Berkeley stumbled upon this potential of using compost to sequester carbon in soils. Um, but there are other uh, practices. So applying compost to mulch is important. Minimizing bare soil and maximizing your soil cover. Now that to me, that sounds like, you know, using mulch, um, growing cover crops. Uh, when soil is bare, uh, it, uh, carbon dioxide can be released from the soil. And when it's covered, it helps slow that release. Um, maximizing living roots. It's the roots and plants that are depositing carbon in the soil. So if you can maximize the amount of living roots in your soil, you are maximizing how much carbon is being stored in your soil. Minimizing soil disturbance. You know, we talked about till. When we till the soil, we are introducing a bunch of air, a bunch of oxygen to the soil by mixing it up. That kickstarts all the microbes to start breathing really heavily and that releases a lot of carbon dioxide. So when we disturb the soil through tilling, we're releasing a ton of carbon from the soil and it goes into the atmosphere. Maximize biodiversity. The more diverse plants that you're growing in your garden, the more diverse sets of roots that are in your garden and soil, the more diverse sets of microbes that are around your plants, uh, plant roots. And the more diverse microbes, the more stable the carbon is in your soil. And then finally, avoiding the synthetics, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides. Now, not only are those products made uh, they're, you know, products of petrochemicals, but when you apply them, you also risk releasing really powerful greenhouse gases, things like nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than um, carbon dioxide. So absolutely avoid the synthetics. Um, and, you know, as far as carbon farming data, there is a lot of support and data coming from farms and ranches, you know, rural soils, but there's not a lot for urban soils. So Stop Waste, we decided, um, let's partner with a bunch of urban farms in the county. So uh, farms like Fremont Leaf, uh, and then uh, let's test their soil to see if their soil building practices are actually storing carbon in the soil. So the pictures here, these are pictures of folks from our team testing soil at some of these urban farms. You know, and I mentioned Fremont Leaf at the beginning, Elaine, who's the farm manager, uh, Elaine, really focuses on using carbon farming practices at Fremont Leaf. And our soil testing findings uh, have shown some really exciting results. And so we, we really wanna share this with people to encourage people to do carbon farming. The image on the left shows the three different depths that we sample soil at these farms. Um, and what we wanna see is we wanna see carbon entering the deeper parts of the soil every year. The image on the right shows how the percentage of carbon increased every year at each depth. You can see the percentage number increase for each depth. Um, and so, especially in the deeper parts of the soil, you know, that increase in percent of carbon, that's new carbon entering the soil. That's the result of building healthy soil. That's exactly what we wanna see. And um, I, we can actually calculate out how much carbon this equals. So at Fremont Leaf, all this new carbon that entered the, the soil between 2018 and 2020, it comes out to be about 26,000 pounds of carbon across one acre. And so to give some perspective, if you drive, or driving nine cars over a year releases 26,000 pounds of carbon. So Elaine's plants at the farm, you know, they, in the soil, they pulled that carbon out of the atmosphere and stuck it back in the soil where it belongs. I think that's really cool. And gardeners can totally be doing this at home. It is cool. All right. So some Q&A from earlier. So uh, Trevor, what's the potential of carbon farming? 
Yeah, we, we had five or six questions about carbon farming. And so what's the potential? Um, you know, what I will say is, you know, we're, we all know that driving less or doing these things that reduce greenhouse gas emissions can help are really important in reducing climate change. So, you know, when we drive less, it prevents carbon from going in the atmosphere and that's important. Um, but driving less cannot reduce how much carbon is already in the atmosphere. But, you know, carbon farming can. Carbon farming is pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and sticking it in soil. So um, I said that there's a lot of data out there, more data um, for farms, ranches, around carbon farming and not so much for urban landscapes. The data that's coming from um, this rural rangeland, UC Berkeley, they estimate that if half of California's rangeland applied compost to their soil, then that those soils and the plants growing in those soils could store about 42 million tons mm -hmm. of carbon in, this, in those soils every year. So that's the same amount of carbon that's released by um, both the commercial and residential energy users in California in one year. So that is no small amount of carbon. Um, plus it comes with all the added benefits of healthy soil. So I think there's a ton of potential with carbon farming and I have a feeling more people are gonna be talking about it. Great, so how can we motivate others to do carbon farming? I thought that was a good question because I don't really, I'm not sure what motivates other people. Um, I was thinking for myself, you know, especially with all these crises that we're dealing with, COVID, fire season, climate change, you know, gardening is a total, totally like a medicine. It's physical, it's mental exercise. You know, it's kind of like a, it helps you provide a little bit of control in your life when other things don't feel so in control. But then there's the added benefit that, you know, gardening, it's, if it's reducing my carbon footprint, that's a pretty cool motivator. Um, I think if folks feel the same way, they feel the same way about gardening, about climate change, they should be sharing that with others. Um, and, you know, hopefully the resources that we share with people today can um, help people be successful with gardening. Um, I also want to add that Stop Waste, since we're a public agency and we do work closely with cities, we have been working with cities to get them more involved and more interested in carbon farming. So our goal, we would love to see cities do carbon farming projects and then for us to get residents connected and engaged in those projects to help more people learn about carbon farming. And there's some good progress so far. A lot of cities in Alameda County have written carbon farming into their climate action plans. So if you're a resident in the county and in a city in the county, you should totally talk to your city about carbon farming, look up their climate action plans and, and see what your cities are doing. I, um, we are approaching 10.30, it's 10.11 right now. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning, we have a ton of resources for people to use. So I'm gonna go through each of these resources and how they might be helpful to you. Don't feel like you need to know where these all are yet because I'm gonna send a follow-up email to everyone with links to all of these. So they will all be super accessible to you. Um, Tools for Building Healthy Soil, it's a brochure. It's an illustrated guide to making and using compost. It's a guide to sheet mulching. It's a guide to worm composting. So if you're really interested in taking some first steps in composting and worm composting, um, the Tools for Building Healthy Soil brochure is perfect for you. Um, it even talks about cover cropping and carbon farming a bit. So um, it's a good all around resource. The Now That Your Lawn Is Gone brochure, Think of it like a maintenance guide. If you've already done sheet mulching, this is a great brochure that provides you some seasonal maintenance tips uh, just to help you keep up with the, you know, the regular garden maintenance that gardens need. The Bay Friendly Gardening Guide, we, we call it our Bible. It is a really in-depth resource that covers all the Bay Friendly Gardening principles um, and talks a ton about how, uh, you know, how you can be a sustainable home gardener. Uh, the Healthy Soils Activity Guide. So all the activities that we introduced today, the nitty gritty, the worm count, and the slate test, those videos are available online and we even have uh, PDF guides that are written guides that help you uh, go step by step in how to do those activities. And they give you some suggestions as to what to look for to help you, you know, evaluate your soil using those tools. Our website is stopwaste.org gardening. That's the hub 
of all of our resources. There are a ton of links from that, from that site that uh, connect you to things like our fall events, other community events, um, connects you to our uh, nursery partners so that they, you can learn how our nurseries, you know, how their hours are affected by COVID, for example. Um, there's tons of resources on composting. The Lawn to Garden website, it's a standalone website that, stand with, that Stop Waste manages. It's the premier resource for, um, for sheet mulching. It does step-by-step -step guides, videos, it has links to, um, has links to the water rebates that your local water agency might be offering. Uh, it also has a marketplace. So Lori mentioned this earlier. If you want to do a big lawn conversion or you want to do a big gardening project and you need to find compost and mulch, the, um, the Lawn to Garden website has a marketplace of all the local compost and mulch vendors that can deliver to your home or your garden. It also has a calculator to help you if you can plug in your square footage of your, of your site or your project, your landscape, and it can help you calculate exactly how much compost and mulch that you'll need for your pellet. So really good uh, resource. And Trevor, mm -hmm. sorry, also for those who are newbies and you wanna think about something like design, uh, there's some, some design templates and there's a bunch of plant lists and different plant recommendations um, as well on Lawn to Garden too. Yes, oh, that's good. And the stopwaste.org slash gardening, um, you know, one of the resources there is uh, Right Plant, Right Place. There is a ton of bay-friendly plant lists on there too. So just, I really recommend look at those two websites and just explore everything. <laughs> um, we also, if you're on Facebook, um, we also have a Facebook group, the East Bay Garden Friends. Uh, it's, you know, moderated by myself, Lori, Jeannie. It's a really welcoming place. If you have questions that you wanna ask or, uh, you know, questions about any types of gardening or building healthy soil, or you want to just share pictures about success that you're having, or you you know see a weird bug that you're not sure what it is, and you want to ask people, East Bay Garden Friends, I really recommend folks to join, and um, it's a it's a very active community. So you'll you know you'll ask a question in the morning, and you'll have responses by the afternoon. And then we have our next th two webinars in this Healthy Soil series. Our next two webinars: Backyard Composting, uh, Saturday, October seventeenth, nine to ten thirty. Lori and Jeannie are going to be going more in depth on how to make your own compost at home. And then on no in November, uh, Thursday the 19th, we'll be doing a film screening of this great film, Symphony of the Soil, uh, that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, it does a, it's a really beautiful film. And uh, if you're really interested in carbon farming, you should definitely check it out because it shows the whole connection between compost, healthy soil, and carbon. Um, when I send this follow-up email, it will contain links to all of those resources, so don't feel like you're going to need to find them yourself. Um, it'll also have an, a link to an evaluation form. We really, really appreciate if people can give us feedback. Like I said, this is our first webinar. We are learning how to do this as we go, so if you have any suggestions, we we'll really appreciate that. And if you fill out an evaluation form, you, will, you can choose to enter into our raffle. Um, we'll randomly select a person in the raffle and that person, um, if they're willing, we'll reach out to them and we can mail them a uh, sheet mulching is my bag, reusable tote. It's a reusable bag. It's really big and sturdy. And it, has, <laughs> it has wiggle e worm, wiggle e worm as uh, printed on the bag. And then we'll also send you printed copies of all these resources. Um, so it is 10:15. Uh, we're going to use the next 15 minutes to cover any questions that went unanswered. Um, I'm going to pull up the Q&A and um, let's see what people ask. So, Lori, do you mind if I send ask these questions your way? Yeah, go for it. Um, so, Lisa asked a question. Um, she asked, uh, what is arbor mulch? And then is, do you suggest, like, the best kind of tree for mulch, like is there, like you mentioned redwood mulch. Do you have any other suggestions for types of mulch? Certainly, um, I love arbor mulch personally, just for the fact that um, you, especially here in Alameda County, we have a, a landfill, landfill ban on organics. So if I am a tree trimmer, if I'm an arborist, I have to take all my stuff far away and pay for it, pay someone to do it. Or I just happen to be in your neighborhood and you just happen to be on my list and I can go ahead and drop it off to you since I'm close by for free. 
So Arbor Mulch is gonna be a free mulch, depending on who you choose. Sometimes they choose a delivery fee, um, but the nice thing about it is it's not only just the wood fiber, but it's actually the leaves and the, and the needles as well. So you're getting a lot of carbon and you're getting a lot of nitrogen, both great elements for, uh, for building out the soil. So yeah, any, mostly you're gonna get a lot of the trees that are indigenous around here. So I find myself with a lot of pine or a lot of oak. Um, occasionally I'll get redwood for certain, but I definitely try to avoid things like eucalyptus or black locust or black walnut. Um, they contain these allopathic properties that don't allow uh, plants to grow around them. As you have looked at the eucalyptus plant, we've seen that there's no other plants underneath it. Uh, the, there's been the research is different about whether or not when you chip those plants, do their allopathic properties still, still stay in place? And to be honest, I'm not really willing to risk it just for the fact that if I've shoveled 10 cubic yards of eucalyptus and now I can't find that I can't plant anything in it. And now I've got to not only get rid of it, um, I got to find a way to get rid of it and uh, I may have to pay for that. So definitely. But Arbor Mulch is awesome. Yes, definitely recommend it. And, and our lawn to garden resource uh, on the marketplace of all the compost and mulch vendors, there are also included um, all the arborists that provide free mulch. Just be aware that free mulch, Laura, you probably said this, but it's going to be a bigger delivery than you may need. So you might, you know, get a big delivery of arbor mulch for free and then share it with your neighbors since you won't be, might not be able to use all of it yourself. Yeah, that's usually one of the first questions I ask them because depending on what arborist, so they say maybe, you know, I've got a five yard truck or I've got a 10 yard truck. And if you use the, the resource calculator on Lawn to Garden, you can kind of figure out what kind of amounts that you may need and call several of them because a lot of people are on lists. So call two or three, and then you can always refuse when they call. So another question someone asked is, uh, they have been digging fallen leaves into their clay soil in the fall for a few years. Is that a good practice? Well, I mean, not necessarily disturbing the soil, but they will compost in place if you just leave them right on top for certain. I mean, that's just composting kind of the natural way. Um, sometimes there's sometimes there's a problem if you mix things that are kind of high in, um, uh, and like wood fiber into the soil because it may pull nitrogen from the soil. So I would recommend not necessarily mixing them in the soil, but still just leaving them on top of the soil as a like leaf mulch, like a fine leaf mulch. And you'll still um, get the same benefits. Yeah. And, you know, and fallen leaves are a great mulch in terms of they are great at suppressing weeds. But if you're, you know, if you have other plants for your garden, you know, fallen leaves are, gr they're great to put into your compost bin. So um, if you're not composting and you have access to fallen leaves, that's great. Uh, another question um, we have, someone asked, our neighbors have many eucalyptus leaves that fall into our yard. I don't put mulch down, so um, can I rake up the eucalyptus? Uh, so she says, I don't put mulch down so that I can rake up the eucalyptus leaves. What is your advice? About what to use the eucalyptus leaves or... Um... Yeah. And again, yeah, I guess what's your advice about using eucalyptus leaves as a mulch? You kind of already covered your thoughts about eucalyptus though. Yeah, definitely. I mean, of course it may, and like I said, if the allopathic properties still exist, then, I mean, then I guess there's no harm to just mulch it. So you could still keep the soil in check. Um, but there might be a possibility that you may not be able to grow anything um, where those leaf, where that leaf litter has fallen. Oh, and I think I see your question. You know, she's asking if I put mulch down, it would be difficult to rake up the eucalyptus leaves. Yes, it um, would definitely. Yes, it definitely would be. That's another reason why I like arbor mulch too, because you can got you can go out and get that I call the pretty mulch, and it looks all nice and beautiful and uniform. But if it's underneath the tree, naturally your leaves are going to go ahead and fall. Um, arbor mulch is a little bit more natural, so when the leaves do fall on it, it just looks instead of just covering up that solid co cover, color, sorry, um, you'll get some, you know, some beautiful diversity in the greens and whatever else falls from your tree or from your, from your neighbor's trees. Yeah. And, you know, I would add just, you know, my neighbors also have eucalyptus and leaves um, do fall into my garden. And, you know, but it's, it's not so many, like if you have, if it's, if the quantity of eucalyptus leaves falling in your garden is pretty small, I wouldn't worry so much about it. 
it's only if it's, you know, if you're getting like a big dumping of eucalyptus leaves in your garden, then I would, it would definitely need to be removed. Um, okay, we have another question. What are the best ways to aerate clay soil? Um, well, like I said, you can use the, you know, you could use the, if you're, if you're trying to really kind of aerate it, um, I would definitely recommend if uh, you would probably water it like at least a couple of days before. Um, that's going to make your job a little bit easier. And then, um, and then enlist the broad fork uh, to it as well. Actually, I'm wondering if, now I'm thinking about it, wondering if it would be beneficial to top dress the area and then use the broad fork um, at the say, right after. That way, not only are you aerating the soil, but you're making your kind of uh, making the compost go down into the areas um, where the holes are. And, you know, the best natural aerators for clay soil are worms. So making sure that you have, you know, top dressing with compost is like, think of it as a long-term solution. You're inviting worms into your soil to naturally aerate, but also plant roots. So getting, finding perennial plants that have a really deep tap root, they call those mining tap roots that go really deep down. And as the tap root goes down into the soil, it forces the soil to, to kind of um, move out of the way and go upwards. So organic matter with worms and deep rooted uh, perennial plants are gonna be your best natural long-term method of aerating your clay soil. Uh, we have another question. So someone has shallow raised beds that are quite spent and look like hardened clay. Only weeds manage to grow. Um, this person's husband tilled it and it's just big chunks of clay with no worms. How should I amend this type of bed? Well, definitely compost for certain. Definitely compost in your raised beds. Um, if you're prepping them for the next season, then I would probably put a layer of compost down on top of that, that clay soil. And then I might, um, because it's been tilled, I would recommend maybe uh, utilizing some cardboard as a weed blocker uh, in your raised bed and then whatever soil you're gonna be using if you're bringing in soil. Otherwise then definitely, um, definitely compost for sure. And in raised beds, um, a good, you know, Laura, do you recommend certain types of mulches for raised beds? Um, definitely, it really all depends on what you're trying to grow. So, and like a perennial bed, something that has kind of woody stems, uh, you could go ahead and use a coarse mulch. Uh, but if you're looking for something like annuals, um, then I would stick with something kind of uh, like straw. So with a coarse mulch, you know, maybe about two to three inches in a raised bed, depending on um, how deep your existing bed is or how much space you have for mulch. Um, but for um, uh, something like annuals, I would probably maybe use about an inch of a fine mulch, something like a straw or sometimes pine needles. Um, you could utilize that or leaves. You can utilize that as well. Um, we had another question. Are the shredded type of mulch better than the bark mulch uh, that comes in the bigger pieces? Oh, the, okay, we're talking about gorilla hair. Are we talking about the shredded mulch? Um, I personally am not a fan. It doesn't really do a good job. The nice thing about when you're looking for mulch, um, you want maybe your pieces to be maybe about two to three inches in length. Those really fit together nicely as a puzzle. Anything bigger and it gets a little cattywampus so if you're looking at those big bark nuggets um, or anything smaller, uh, may do a decent job, but you'd have to go thicker because it's gonna decompose uh, way faster for certain. What was the other section of that? Um, um, and the bark mulch. So you know how oh. the mulch that comes like in the, like they're roundish pieces of bark. Yeah, you still wanna kind of really go with something that's about two to three inches. That I mean, to be honest, I've shoveled my fair share of mulch. That always really lays the best. Um, it kind of, I don't say stack, but it really stacks really well. And then um, as opposed to like something bigger or something smaller. So it's um, 1027. I'm going down all the questions and it looks like Jean has been able to answer most of them. Um, Thanks, Jean. So I want, I do want folks to know. Um, so Lori and I, our emails are here. Um, Lori's compost gal at hotmail.com. My email is tprobert at stopwaste.org. Um, 
we're going to continue looking through these questions and we have a little Google doc where uh, we have all the questions out and we're going to make sure that they all got answered. If you felt like your, your question didn't get quite answered, you can please feel free to email us and follow up. Um, my goal is to look at all these questions and if we didn't answer them, I can send out answers myself. Um, and uh, once again, our, our, uh, our um, website is stopwaste.org slash gardening. Uh, I'm also going to be, um, like I said, sending out a following up, follow up email. That email will have um, the, the link to our um, evaluation and it's gonna have all of the links to all the Stop Waste resources. So many of these questions can also be answered via our resources. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We would we would have loved for today to have been an in-person workshop like like we're used to, where we can have yes. more of a conversation. <laughs> we really are looking forward to when we'll be able to do that again. Um, so just to honor everyone's time and to end on time, uh, Lori, thank you so much for presenting with me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I still, even if it's got to be in front of a screen, I still screen. I'm still happy to get, have the opportunity to teach. And a lot of people are interested. So happy gardening, everyone. And please folks, you know, register for our next webinars, Backyard Composting on October 17th, and then the Symphony of the, F Symphony of the Soil film screening um, on November 19th. And um, yes, look out for that follow-up email. And I really hope everyone enjoys the rest of their weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you.